Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by the legendary teacher, Pete Magadini. Pete, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you, Bart. So um, today's kind of a, a unique episode because we're going to talk about your career as both a musician and a teacher, which you have very, I mean, you've been a teacher for a long time. So going back to Michael Shreve from uh, who played with Santana up to the very famous Mike Johnston, um, who everyone knows and loves um, from Mike's Lessons and Modern Drummer Podcast, formerly, I guess. But um, so um, I think a cool way to do this is there's a lot of history involved, as we've talked previously and kind of gotten a plan together. But um, so why don't we start with the beginning of your career and your drumming? And, and as you go, you can just kind of fill us in on some cool history stuff and, and drum stuff along the way. Um, sounds good. Um, I'll try to uh, sort of uh, give you just a, a brief summary of uh, how I got started and uh, and how I got serious. Cool. Um, I My first drum experience was in the elementary school band in Palm Springs, California. Uh, Catherine Finchie, uh, uh, elementary school in the fifth grade. And they had a band and a band director. And uh, in the sixth grade, I was still playing. And uh, most of the guys had dropped out by then, but uh, I was still playing. And uh, I played in school bands up until high school. And I and, uh, went to high school in Arizona and uh, got pretty serious. I was playing in rock bands. I was actually doing some recording uh, uh, with some kind of major people already uh, when I was quite young. Um and uh, actually did a, a, a track with Phil Spector, which was uh, cool. the beginning of kind of his, his thing, you know. But um, I, I, I took I, – so I got a teacher when I got out of high school. I realized that I was getting really serious about drumming, and I didn't know a lot of things I needed to know about it uh, were escaping me. So I, I'll just mention this. I got a great teacher when I was 17, just out of high school, Don Bothwell in Phoenix. I was only in Phoenix for four years, but I had this terrific teacher and he brought me a long way. So that's there you great. go. That's how my teaching started, hit his influence. Yeah, that's um, that's funny how I think a teacher can either make you or break you. And that's so sad, but like you, you know that a good teacher can make you absolutely love the drums, but a bad teacher can like make you hate an instrument. Or you think of like piano lessons where you go, oh, I hate piano lessons. Like you have a little old lady who's teaching you or something after school and you don't want to play. But if you have the right teacher who who works with you, it can change your whole life. Yeah, he had come around to the high school and he played, uh, took us all into a studio and he played for the drummers and the high school band. And I, I, I just couldn't believe the guy I was so enamored with him. He, he was he was everything, a great player. He knew he knew what he was talking about and so forth. But you're absolutely right. Uh, I had a few bad teachers. And as long as you hang in there, you're going to learn something from bad teachers as well. One yeah. thing is, if you're going to teach, you don't want to be like them. No, that's you know a what good, I mean? That's a good point. So yeah. uh, you, you don't want to teach and have students feel uh, less than. You know, it's your job, I think, as a teacher, if somebody's doing the work. Now, if somebody's like if you're in school and you're teaching a course to somebody in drums and they're slacking off and they're trying to just get a credit, that's one thing. But if somebody's coming to you for lessons and they're working hard at it, some guys are going to be more talented than others, you know. Yeah. But you know what? Some of the guys who just do the work and work the hardest, they'll get a lot further. Uh, they'll get a lot more out of it and go a lot further than some of the guys who have the pure talent. Yeah, and. <laughs> I always kind of, in, in my mind, I find that, that when I'm doing the show, I equate things. So I went to school for like um, video and like audio engineering stuff. And a lot of the drum stuff in my life corresponds with that, where you'd be in class and there'd be people who'd be slacking off and who wouldn't be paying attention in like a recording studio class. And I'm like, isn't this what you want to do? But yeah, it doesn't like it's the same with drumming where but and those people, a lot of them have literally nothing to do with like media for their career and it's the same with drumming it's like okay if it's a class whatever but the people who thrive are obviously the people who like are obsessed with it and love it like like all of us 
Yeah, and and maybe they're not obsessed with it at first. You know, maybe yeah, ma- maybe it, maybe it's up to you to show them some things. Maybe you recognize something in them that they're not even seeing in themselves. You know, absolutely. And 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 you say, hey, listen, you got something here. I'm I'm I'm, I'm ready to work with you, but you know, you're going to have to work with me too. You know, otherwise, let's let's not fool ourselves. You know, I I don't get too many students anymore who aren't real serious. If they study with me, generally they know why why they're studying with me and uh and they spend the time and they do the work and uh you know we 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 take it as far as it can go and as far as they want to go yeah and uh i've had some fabulous students and uh who are doing really great in the business the two that you mentioned of course michael is a great example of a perfect student who was enjoying some success he was he was with carlos santana when he was studying with me but Carlos hadn't hit yet. The band hadn't. I was asking him questions like, how's the band doing? And he'd say, oh, pretty good. You know, we played this gig or that gig. And then he said, you know, I asked him, how's the band? He said, oh, yeah, we made a record. And then three weeks later, so how's, the, how's the record doing? Hey, it's doing pretty good. They got it racked out in front of Tower Records in San Francisco. Oh, I said my to God. my wife, you know, Michael Shreve's band, they got the record racked out in front. I said, that's pretty serious. You know, let's go out and check it out, you know. And, uh, of course, that, that album went platinum and the band went platinum and, and, and Michael went platinum uh, with that great solo he played on uh, Woodstock, the Woodstock documentary. Yeah. There's that 10-minute uh, drum solo by Michael Shreve, and you'll see all that great handwork and all that stuff he worked on so hard. And it's still today. I mean, Michael's still playing at a high level. I mean, he's not. Uh, he's not. He doesn't play any less. He plays. He plays stronger now than he probably even played then. You know, because those yeah. things. You know, if you learn correctly, uh, especially technique, which which I always work with my students with technique, just because we all, we immediately assume that we have to have good technique. It's not. It's not going to be some magical, you know, formulas and uh, here your stick's going to be three inches high and then four inches high. And then, no. you know, we just we just work on it. I studied with the best technicians and I know what I'm talking about. So we get that out of the way as we're going. You know, hmm. we don't just concentrate on that. We, we work on everything. So, yeah. um, the, so, you know, the guys are always playing. It's not like, okay, we're gonna, I'm going to break you down and we're going to start all over again. I, I never do that. <laughs> no, and, and you hear about those kind of teachers and, and it's a little bit uh, drill sergeant-ish. Like I know that we, uh, I did an episode about Max Abrams, um, the teacher in, in, uh, in England, and, and he had a very, um, it sounded like he had a very drill sergeant kind of attitude of, you know, this is what you're going to do and you're going to practice. And it's just very different. But let me ask you, so, because you had both teaching career and um, obviously as a performer, but like, when did you start teaching? Like, how old were you when you started teaching? Okay, so I was taking uh, lessons with Don at the uh, Liederman's Drums, uh, Liederman's Music Store in Phoenix. And then he got busy with students and other other things. And uh, uh so he gave me, he said, would you like to teach my beginning students? Hmm. And I said, yeah, sure. That sounds great. So uh, uh, I, I started with students he couldn't handle. I started taking them, you know, and uh, that's how I got started. Wow. And, uh, you know, I, I've always done both. I've always taught, but I've always played. I'm a serious player. I mean, I, sure. it, it's all about playing to me. As a matter of fact, I always tell guys, you know, Check out a teacher if he doesn't really have good playing credentials. Uh, I don't know, man. You know, I, to me, that's uh, that's a red flag for a lot of them. Yeah, I mean, I, I I see both sides of that. Of of um, there's people who are just they love to just teach and like like for me, I mean, I, I'm in Cincinnati, which isn't the biggest like music hub, so it's harder to get the big credits. But it's like. But it does definitely help when you see that, like, oh, they've done this and this. I'm not talking about big time credits. I'm just talking about knowing what it what it is to go out and and, and play professionally. Sure. Uh, at, at a drum set, you know, I'm not talking about percussionists and orchestras and stuff. Yeah. And and that's really important too. I mean, I, I studied percussion in, in at the conservatory with a wonderful percussionist. 
who became the timpanist with the New York Philharmonic for 31 years <laughs> before he passed away a few years ago. Wow. And uh, so I had that background and, and I admired a great deal. But for drum set playing, um, you got to, you got to, you got to hear your teacher play a little bit and, and, and like it, I think. You yeah. know, if he says, you got to do this, but I can't play it. Um, I don't know. I, I think that, uh, anyway, if, sure. I, if I can't play it, I usually don't teach it. So that's probably that's smart. Talking. Probably a smart thing to not uh, <laughs> do. But all right. So um, then simultaneously, you're, um, you're teaching, but you're also performing out. And you've got some big credits. So why don't we talk about that, about, you know, your um, your background as a performer, like the big, you know, obviously I'm sure you played locally as you grew up and everything, but um, what was your big kind of breakthrough moment? Actually, maybe my first gig as a country and Western drummer in uh, Arizona, just playing in a club with these really seasoned professional country musicians uh, every night for a year and a half. Yeah, uh, uh, it, it gave me a, a, a real good taste of, uh, you know, journeyman, even though I was really young, I was only 16 when I started. Hmm. But uh, uh, so when I got to playing, I got interested in jazz through my teacher. And once I got interested in jazz, I, I, I spent an awful lot of time working on that part of my my playing. So I went to New York City and I studied with Roy Burns and I played in New York City at a club all the time I was there, two Italian guys and me. And uh, we played uh, from nine to four in the morning or something, but I was in New York and it felt great. And, uh, and when I moved to, from New York to San Francisco to go to school, I went to the conservatory and I met George Duke at the conservatory. And uh, George and I hooked up and we formed the Georgia Duke Trio. And so then I spent five years with George, four or five years with George. And we wound up playing in a club in San Francisco, a black club, four nights a week. And it was a real popular place. And uh, a lot of uh, musicians and, uh, and athletes and so forth. But mainly it was a black club. Uh, not that it and everybody was welcome, but it was, that's sure. just the way it was. Yeah. And then Al Jarreau sat in one night and then he got the gig and then he was with us for two years. Mm, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And, Man, uh, that's, well, you got to be there. I think the, the, the key thing that, I mean, it's so obvious, but a lot of times people don't force themselves to think about it. It's like for things to happen, you have to be there or you have to be doing it. Things rarely just happen to you. You know what I mean? So yeah. the fact that you were there doing it, it's it's that's how you meet people. Well, we all moved to L.A., George and I and the bass player, John Hurd, and, uh, and Al. Everybody moved to L.A. at a different time. You know, the, the gig kind of, you know, ended and we went there and, and George took off right away. And then and then John got really busy. And then I got busy in L.A. And uh, to your point. If I wasn't in LA, I wouldn't have gotten those calls. Yeah. You know, people weren't going to call call me up in San Francisco and say, "Oh, I heard you, I heard you play with George Duke at a little club, and we <laughs> want you to come down and work with Diana Ross." Yeah, Th that I got the Diana Ross gig because I happened to be in the right place at the right time to go to an audition that she was holding, and uh, she picked the rhythm section, and I happened to be the drummer she picked, so. That was because I was in L.A. and I, I was ready to do that audition, and uh, it happened, you know, so. That's awesome. What year was that? What year was Diana Ross? Uh, that was when she first started as a single hmm. performer. I had been with Bobby Gentry, and then uh, uh, I moved over to Diana Ross in 1970 and 71. Was it a pretty technical gig? I mean, you know what I mean? Was It, it seems a little more like you're well, in the they, background, they, you're playing the album. Yeah, they needed some because this was we were playing all big rooms, big showrooms at Las Vegas, New York, uh, Miami, uh, Canada, and we'd stay there for two weeks or three weeks in the same room playing uh, hmm. six nights in 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 Las Vegas seven nights, and um, so uh, that was that kind of showroom. Sure. 
with a big band. And uh, so we'd, we'd have some numbers that we'd have to play. We'd had to read. We had to be good readers, mm-hmm. but we also had to play Motown. We had to know how to play Motown. And uh, But, you know, I had played, uh, going back to my country days and my rock days, I, I was I always felt I was, and still do feel I'm a pretty good backbeat drummer. And so uh, she heard that in my playing because uh, a big part of that show, you know, Ain't No Mountain High Enough yeah. is, is a whole lot different than uh, – you know, don't rain on my parade, which was the opening number, which is a big band swing number, and then ain't no mountain high enough is a straight ahead backbeat Motown get it down, yeah, you know, <laughs> cool thing. So yeah, so oh, that man. show was fun because it it had everything in it. You know, how old were you at that point? Just to kind of keep the timeline, twenty eight, nice, um, maybe twenty six. Yeah, I'm not twenty six, wow. twenty eight, something like that. You think of like like I was watching recently a thing about um, Levon Helm, and it was a it was like a newer documentary about the band. Um, like we were brothers, I forget the name of it, but um, it was like talking about playing them with um, the Hawks, where it was like they were like, oh yeah, we were f- I was fourteen years old or something. <laughs> and it's like yeah, so you started when you were sixteen playing out and stuff. I mean, that's just uh, that you got an early start, which I think is great. And it's obviously a different world now than there's no, where there's, there's no social media. Then there's no, it's all kind of, you know, have, like we keep saying, having your face out there and everything. Well, you know, uh, I, I think it's exciting now. I mean, it's, it's always been exciting. It's always been different from decade to decade with me and it's exciting now, you know, I'm, I'm doing stuff online and, uh, I'm getting better at doing some, uh, some of the stuff that uh, I play that uh, people maybe haven't heard me do. Some of my polyrhythm books, yeah. I to demonstrate some of that stuff, and I'm finally getting a, getting a chance to get it out there. And I have some very complex stuff written in some some of my books. And uh, now I'm getting a chance to play it a little bit and talk about it and put it on YouTube. And it doesn't cost me a dime. It's just a matter of no, you know, spending the time to learn to learn how to do it technically. Uh, and, yeah, really. Uh, you know, and uh, so I, I find it exciting. Uh, and man, if I want to hear somebody play, I, I guess I can hear anybody I want any time of the day. <laughs> yeah, you just search it and, and there they are. And, uh, and there they are, yeah. And your books are, are pretty, um, you know, you have very like famous books. And, and like we talked last week about kind of the polyrhythm stuff, which I want to get into that about into more like, you know, maybe you give me and the listeners some like, you know, lesson type stuff that we can we can take and and work on, but pushing forward with your career a little bit, and then we can just kind of, you know, hit hit on some some big moments there. But so obviously, you're still teaching your do you do clinics and things? I mean, as a 28 year old, I'm sure you're just trying to gig with Diana Ross. And uh, what what came after that? Well, after Diana Ross, I got a few calls to do some more road gigs. But um, I was living in LA and uh, had had two kids and uh, I we had played Toronto and uh, my wife at the time was Canadian and uh, I decided to move to Toronto because they had a uh, I liked the musicians up there they were they were very good and they had a vibrant studio scene and um, I wanted to play st- more studio work so to make a long story short I enrolled in a uh, at the University of Toronto to do a master's degree in percussion. And I thought, well, I'm up there. If it didn't work out, at least I would have done something, you know. So yeah. uh, that worked out great. Uh, I had some great teachers there. And uh, uh, they, it was a, there's a percussion group called Nexus. And those guys were teaching there. The two guys had found that group Nexus. that hmm. they won, They've won a Grammy and they, they still tour. And, cool. And, and, and so I studied with them and I got busy in the studios in Toronto and, uh, and then I started teaching there and I've had some great students up there in Canada, but, uh, I lived, I lived in Canada for uh, about 17 years before I I came back to the States Hmm. and, uh, I wound up in Montreal and, uh, teaching at, uh, McGill and Concordia universities and uh and playing uh, around but in canada i played with some great people i played with chet baker i played with uh, sonny stitt twice 
uh, you know, some really big name jazz artists who were coming up to play uh, in the city. Uh, I got to I got to play with some of them. So that that was, uh, you know, that I don't know where else I could live where I, I could have played with. Yeah. Big names from the West Coast and big names from the East Coast who were all coming up to Canada to play uh, a couple of these uh, jazz rooms where, sure. where I was a house drummer some yeah. of the time, you know. I mean, Canada's, I, I've only been to Vancouver, but it is just so awesome. I mean, they're like, it was such a, it felt like when I was in Vancouver, it felt like New York and San Francisco were like, combined and it was like city with like the you know the water and everything it was really cool but i need to go and explore more of canada when that's where we're physically able to do that uh after <laughs> this is all done yeah yeah it's a different place uh yeah it's it's really quite different a, a small population 35 million maybe 40 million people uh, hmm. in the entire country wow, and the entire country is bigger than the USA. So I wound yeah. up giving clinics all over the, all over the country for Pearl. I was with Pearl drums at the time hmm. and uh, the clinics took off and everybody was, uh, you know, anxious to have me come and give a clinic at their drum shop. And uh, boy, I had it all to myself for a, a few years of, of just doing clinics. And I, I went all over the country and, uh, yeah, it was it was uh, it was interesting being up there, but you know, like you say, logistics sometimes is is uh, the most important part of this gig. Uh, it used yeah. to be. I don't know if it's it's that's way that way anymore, but uh, uh, sure. you know, guys are making good careers now, living in smaller places, which is nice to see. You know, yeah, absolutely. And the clinic thing, and and just what you said, kind of made me think of like like I know Joe Morello did a ton of clinics where. You can, and a lot of guys now, um, uh, let's say Mike, Mike Johnston, these, a lot of people, he does a ton of stuff, but there's, there's a bunch of drummers who, which is great. They become clinicians and you almost get this reputation as being a clinician where like it, it kind of, I feel like it takes your teaching and this is just the perspective of like an outsider. seems like it takes your teaching to the next level because everyone kind of goes like, oh, that's Pete Magadini you know, the clinician, he's doing these clinics. He must know everything. It seems like it, it doing the clinics really helps to solidify you as more of like a quote unquote famous teacher. And I guess what I'm getting at is, did that lead to you getting like, I know on your, like the people you've, you've taught, there's like, uh, like, let's say like Chad Wackerman and stuff. Did it lead to other drummers who are gigging professional drummers coming to you because you're a clinician? Uh, you know, it, it's hard to say uh, exactly why um, people contact me uh, to to study privately, but usually they've heard about me uh, one way or another, uh, either through one of my students or they read uh, maybe a biography of, of 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 about me and some of the people I've taught. But uh, I I don't know. Uh, you know, when I, when I give drum clinics, uh, I try to, you know, I try to pick a certain area that, that uh, might appeal to that audience because, uh, you know, if I do polyrhythms and I have somebody who just wants to know about playing basic drums, uh, then we're not going to communicate too well, you know, mm-hmm. cause that's, that's pretty advanced stuff. Yeah. But, um, Sure. Anyway, I yeah, you know I, I just I just want people to come to a clinic and 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 leave with something, and feel that you know that uh, they they've learned something. Some guys give clinics; they're not really used to it. They just do a lot of playing, and then they go, "Are there any questions?" <laughs> you know. So yeah, yeah. But there's both. I've seen both different. Like you go to Pasic or you go to them at your local drum shop, and you see both kinds, and you go. You leave sometimes inspired from someone playing a bunch, but exactly. um, you got to speak to everyone a little bit. Yeah, right. And and you know, I, I don't get me wrong. I admire those guys who just sit sit. I saw Cindy Blackman at the uh, drum fest in Quebec, uh, Montreal, one year, and she just got out and she just sat down at the drums and she just played a solo for twenty minutes, and it was like incredible. You know, yeah. she's an incredible player. She's awesome. Yeah. And, She's extremely uh, good. Perfect technique. Her technique is so beautiful to watch. You know, she weighs like ninety pounds. I mean, she's not big. No. And she hits the drums like a truck. You know, if she wants to, 
And that's yeah. all from this great technique that she has. And, she, you know, I met her once after one of her concerts, and I didn't know she knew me. And I said, hi, Cindy, I just love the way you play. She, uh, I'm Pete Megan. She said, oh, Pete, wow. Yeah, I want to talk to you. Go in the dressing room, you know. Hmm, and I got to cool. get, get the money for the guys and then go in the dressing room. So I went in the dressing room, and I'm there with the guys, and the guys are kind of splitting. And, and I'm left there with uh, Robbie Coltrane. And the two of us, I'm, I'm there with John Coltrane's son and because he was on <laughs> the gig. Cool. Wow. And I'm going, uh, yeah. I said, you know, I heard your dad play live quite a few times. Man. And I figured, well, that might be something to talk to him about because he never heard his dad play live. He was His dad was gone by the time he was, Jeez, sure. you know, a youngster. So uh, oh, we talked cool. about that. And then she came back. And I didn't know how she knew me, but she had gone through my book, Polyrhythms for the Drum Set. And uh, when I hear her play, I hear this loose feeling that she gets with her time. And when you go through that book, that's what that book does. Mm -hmm. It opens you up. It widens your playing. It, uh, it, it takes your headlights from down the middle of the highway and expands them all over the road. Yeah. So, uh, Well, why don't we do that right now? Why don't you – maybe because we talked about having a little polyrhythm section of this. Why don't we maybe – why don't you kind of give us your general, like, you know, uh, overview of polyrhythms that can help to do exactly what you just said, where you can kind of like broaden your horizons. And, um, and I'm going to, uh, say before that, that I have, as my foot has been in a cast for three months, I, my right foot, I'm a little out of practice. So bear with me if my mind is not quite there with you, okay. cause, uh, right. but everyone else is probably way more practiced than me at the moment. So give us your kind of spiel on um on polyrhythms okay well basically uh i i studied indian music one summer in uh in san francisco at berkeley at university of california uh ali akbar khan came with his musicians to teach and so uh there was about 40 of us in the polyrhythm class which lasted eight weeks every day and when we were finished there was only four of us left because it's so demanding, you know, even just to play the tabla, just to get a sound out of that instrument takes forever. Sure, I've heard. <laughs> and uh, But he used to let me hang back after class with my drum pad, and we used to kind of improvise back and forth. And uh, he showed me, the teacher showed me, he says, I'm going to teach you about rhythmic ratios. Oh, rhythmic ratios, wow, what's that, you know? And so he showed me, like, if, we're, if you're in 4-4, four, four, and you take all those notes and you divide them into triplets and sixteenths, eighths, triplets, and sixteenths, and all those combinations, you're still in 4-4. Four, four. Yeah. But you can also go in 6 over 4 and then take all those notes, eights, triplets, and sixteenths, and drive, divide them in the same combinations. And then you're in a ratio of – you have two ratios going, one to one, which is the 4-4, four, four, and one and a half times faster, which is the six. Hmm. So six, so one and a half to one. I said, oh, one and a half to one. I never thought about it. I knew I could play in six. I had played enough Latin and some African beats, and I knew that. But but then it goes, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then half note triplet is three. So three, four, five, six, seven, eight are the basic polyrhythmic ratios. Once you get those down, then you just subdivide notes in the middle. And uh, but you need how to you need to know how to feel both rhythms at the same time, and that's that's the trick to it. Yeah. Because most people want to just hang on to the four four. They want to play some pattern that comes out as a polyrhythm, but it only so happens to come out as a polyrhythm. You're not hearing it as a polyrhythm. Sure. You're just saying, oh look at that's that that's quarter note triplet just seems to float out of this exercise I'm playing. Yeah. So he taught me, and, and here's a simple thing to try. If you want to try something that is the basic, basic thing you need to do when you talk uh, do polyrhythms. If you have four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, and then you have six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, I'm going to have to tap on something here. Sure, so. go, go for it. And so we have six. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
Now you count to four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Uh, One, yeah. two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four. Now you're using both sides of the front lobes, and you're beginning to experience mental rhythmic independence. Yes. I feel like it's one of those things where you, you hear words talking about it, and it's just but to hear someone actually do that and split it is just really helpful because that's it. Polyrhythms are always something for me where I've, I've, like you've said, I've played many different things, but I'm not actually feeling it. You know what I mean? Like I'm not yeah. actually like comfortable where that, that helped just to hear that. Yeah, it, 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 exactly. Because that is really the basis of all of it. You know, if you start there and the book that you need, if you want to start with polyrhythms is my first one is called polyrhythms, the musician's guide. And it's published by Hal Leonard. It's available everywhere. Cool. And the drum set version of that is polyrhythms for the drum set. And that has to do with coordinating polyrhythms between hands and feet. So everything's in a polyrhythm, you know. Gotcha. Wow. Yeah, and that now if you awesome. want to focus that all back to 4-4 four, four and just play, bap, 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 you know, some just good backbeat stuff. Your backbeat and your funk playing is going to be so much stronger than it was before because now all those notes are educated. Yeah. You know, you can feel the space around them. And people are going to say things like, wow, it sure feels good to play with you, man. You know? Yeah. And uh, that's the kind of things you want to hear when you're a drummer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You want to hear it's not, it's hard and, and uh, man, you keep slowing down or you keep speeding <laughs> yeah. up. Oh yeah. yeah, that's great. So, and I'll put a link to the book and and your probably your your website, which I'm sure has everything on it. But um, yeah, that's that's really cool. Polyrhythms, honestly, there's there's certain things with drumming that are um, that are like maybe it's just I think everyone knows what I'm talking about. Where you like you you kind of like learn and you find it like like I guess scary is the wrong word for it, but it's yeah. daunting, and it doesn't need to be. You know, you just uh, got to practice. Exactly. I mean, you know, the Indian musicians have been playing these for a thousand years and, and Africans too, you know, they, they play polyrhythmically and uh, we've yeah. all seen an African ensemble with dancers and we're going, Oh, that's, that's so great. Look at all the drums and they're all doing something different. And, but the dancers are pulling it all together and what are they doing? You know? Yeah. Now, Absolutely. my books aren't African or Indian or anything. It just gives you the ability to hear that. And, and if you if you start at the beginning and just take a few pages, you'll know more. In, in three pages, you'll know more about polyrhythms than most people uh, in the world. <laughs> yeah. You know. You just got to do it. When I'm speaking to myself. <laughs> you, like, you just got to do it. Where you just got to practice it and sit down, which um, is the... That's just the, the the thing in general is practice, actually practicing, sitting down and having educated practicing, which, um, you know, and maybe we talk, I think we should talk about him because one of your uh, very esteemed students, Mike Johnston, who um, he has been very helpful to me. Um, and if you're listening to this, hey, Mike, thanks very much. But he he um, he made me his pick of the week one week on the Modern Drummer podcast when he was wow. on it with Mike Dawson. And it, it, it just it. I don't think he I, I'm sure he does realize, but it quadrupled my listenership. It introduced me to a whole bunch of people who had never heard the show and it just has grown since then. So I owe him a big thank you for that. But um, how did your relationship start with uh, with Mike? Oh, well, uh, Mike called me. Um, he said, my name's Mike Johnston. He, 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 no, you know, he was unknown. I mean, I mean. I never heard of him. He, he hadn't lessons with Mike and all that. That was, that was to come, you yeah, know? Sure. And, um, he called me and he, and he, the thing that impressed me about Mike was first of all, when he came to me, he was already playing really well. He was playing with a group called Simon says, mm -hmm. uh, I thought they sounded really great. He was really up on the band himself. And, uh, I think we're going to go places and we have some good sponsorship and something to do with Disney and, and so, but that was cool that, that he still just came every week. He had to drive two hours to a lesson or an hour and a half anyway, because I was in Northern California in a little town called Novato outside of San Francisco, and he was driving down from Sacramento area. So that's quite a drive. 
and uh, he'd be all prepared and he and you know I I introduced him to the polyrhythm stuff fairly soon because he was quite advanced already and he just did the work he kept doing the work and uh we talk about the band and it looked like things were going he's always exuberant you know very exuberant and uh but the exuberance never got in the way of the lesson the lessons were always practiced flawlessly and then he'd add some to him he said look what else i did with this and here's what i did with that you know steve smith studied with me for a little while out of the polyrhythm mm. book uh, polyrhythms for the drum set and he kept giving me exercises back that he invented himself and I, i'd have to go home and practice to uh to get him down you know i felt like i was taking the lessons <laughs> after a while yeah that's a pretty big that's a big name <laughs> And um, so Mike just kept doing it. And uh, so I introduced him to Yamaha guys. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm with Yamaha now. I've been with for quite a while. And, uh, and this was in the 90s. And uh, he came to the drum fest, same drum festival in Canada. And I said, uh, if you can make it, I'm gonna, I want to introduce you to these guys. I think the band's going to hit and you're going to, and I, you're impressing me a lot. So they gave him um, an endorsement, you know. And then the next thing you know, the band, something happened. The band collapsed. It didn't go. Uh, he went back to Sacramento. He was kind of down. He just started teaching uh, himself at the uh, at, at one of the stores up there. I uh, can't remember the name of it, but fairly well-known uh, music store. And uh, I said, Mike's, how's it going? He said, oh, you know, the band didn't happen, but I'm, I'm giving lessons in that. And the next thing you know, he started doing the lessons online, and um, yeah, and look well, what happened. Uh, that, I know he that he, took I, off. I should tell you, he's been on the show. So at that point, it's kind of where he picked up his episode because he he basically um, was kind of like you know I'm sure you, uh, so someone else on the show said someone's always firster, so you can't say someone was first, but Mike was probably one of the first people to do online drum lessons, and and he kind of gave us that. That whole story, and and he mentioned you a little bit in in, in his episode too, but obviously it was more about um, just the starting the lessons. I was I was just glad to see him, you know, the, all this hard work pay off, you know, and uh, and he's got this talent, you know, to to talk to people, and he, he's a hard worker, you know. He he, he not he not only has the online lessons, but he has people flying in to go to the school and. Now, the thing about Mike is that he played with Simon Says and maybe a few other bands, but, you know, he plays really well. He is a hell of a player. Yeah. And that's because he just works so hard at it, you know. He yeah. knows polyrhythms. You hear it in his playing. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I teach my drummers a lot about Latin playing, too. And you notice when he, he does lessons with Mike, he'll do a segment on Brazilian drumming or uh, – or the influence of Latin on his own playing. And then, then he'll play some outlandish thing that uh, incorporates some of those grooves, you know? Yeah, definitely. And, and I see I see guys like Mike um, and a lot of other drummers and even talking to you and like just people where like it just motivates you to A, practice the drums, but B, for me, it's like I'll see, let's stick with Mike Johnston. You'll say, oh man, he's posting a video every day. Like I need to keep, doing an episode of the podcast every week, you know, it kind of pulls you and you see other people doing very clean, um, crisp video. It's just, it's people like that. I think who, who inspire people to, um, to, to do whatever it is they want to do. It might be like, like he's talking about like, you know, tea all the time. <laughs> so it's like, you know, and he takes cool pictures of it. It's like, it might inspire you to get into something new. So, um, I think that's a part of what being a teacher is. It's just like you said, your first teacher is just a cool guy who makes you want to makes you want to do it. Right. I mean, that's that's a huge part of it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I've had uh, four great teachers, uh, uh, Don Bothwell, Roy Burns, uh, Roland Koloff, the percussionist I mentioned before, and then the Nexus guys at the University of Toronto and then Mahaprush Misra, my Indian guru teacher and and then i studied some african drumming too with uh, some guys from wesleyan university also with ne a nexus mainly russell hartenberger and uh african 
if you look at some of my videos, you'll see me play some of these basic African grooves. And from all from some of these basic African A way grooves, all our all our drumming in this in this continent came from, including Brazil and also including uh, the uh, Caribbean islands. So salsa and Brazilian and jazz and straight ahead funk drumming, you know, has these African roots. And I think it's important to learn a little bit about African drumming as well, yeah. which Mike did. You know, I, I, everybody who studies with me gets gets this one African pattern because out of that comes almost everything we do. So one way or another. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it all goes back. That's kind of the basis of this show is just kind of going and, and digging in and finding the 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 origin of everything. And in reality, it all goes back to like uh, Africa and, and that that kind of stuff, which I've, I've done some episodes that touch on it, but I really need to do, I need to find the, like the, the, um, the absolute expert on African, you know, rhythms, which I imagine will be someone from Africa. Uh, that seems fitting, but, um, Oh yeah. There's some good experts out there too. The, yeah, yeah, for sure. Definitely. But I, before we end, I just want to give credit to some of the, my favorite drummers from the past that had a great influence on me, Max Roach, Yep. Philly Joe Jones, Shelly Mann, uh, uh, Elvin Jones, Roy Haynes, um, and uh, uh, Paul Motion with hmm. Bill Evans. Yeah, I'm not familiar with him. I, I was going to say everyone before, I I'll check him out, obviously. I'm, I'm always on the hunt for, for great drummers, but everyone you just listed has just become... Um, like, I, I honestly think if there was like a Mount Rushmore of drummers, most, I mean, and then obviously there's a, there's a long list more of like, you know, oh, many yeah. greats, but those yeah. guys, I mean, the, 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 the Joneses and, <laughs> and Max Roach and I mean, all these guys are and Shelly Mann. I really like Shelly Mann. I feel like he's, um, he's well known. He, he is obviously a well-known drummer, but he's not quite as well known to the the outer circle as like your buddies and your genes. But um, Shelly Mann is just unbelievable. And he, he seems like a really nice guy, obviously. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful person. Uh, yeah. I got yeah. to know him a little bit and, uh, and, you know, and John Bonham had a big effect on me. I love the way he plays drums and, uh, yeah. and all the guys who play with Frank Zappa, all those guys are terrific drummers. You know, I thought about doing an episode, um, which I have enjoyed a lot of Zappa music, but I need to go far further in. Um, but the, like the, I was thinking an episode would be cool about the drummers of Zappa and the another one about the drummers of Weather Report because there's like those two, you know, bands have so many great drummers. It's kind of one of those things where it's like a, um, it just churned out great drummers. You know what I mean? There's something special yeah. about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before Weather Report, Joe Zawinol played with uh, Cannonball Adderley's quintet. Yeah. And that drummer was Lewis Hayes. Yes. Also another terrific drummer. Well, mostly known for playing with that band. But uh, yeah, I've posted some videos of him online and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking so I don't get mixed up with with another one. But I believe that there are um, a couple good solo videos of him, which I'll have to check and re and, and repost them. But um, yeah, it's when I started code, I, I think I told you, but every day I post a cool old drum video that I find of like, you know, from the 20, I just posted one from 1928 up to like, you know, cool modern ones. But someone said to me once, like, you know, what, what happens when you run out of drum videos and you run out of drummers? And uh, two years later, I've never had one day where I've had an issue finding a different yeah. drummer. It's like, I was going to say, I don't think that's going to happen ever. And that was a non drummer who said that. But like, um, there's so how do you maybe this is a, a little bit of an out there question, but like, all right, so for young drummers, um, new drummers, I should say, how do you draw inspiration from a drummer when you're watching it like when you watch philly joe jones or when you're watching john bonham how are you kind of doing your homework and pulling things from him what's what do you what do you typically do uh typically i just listen <laughs> and love well, sure, it you know sure yeah uh, i i really don't i don't i don't generally try to analyze 
at least not not at that moment, you know. Maybe if I listen to him a lot and then I'm trying to pull out. I know with Elvin, I really, really uh, analyzed the way he played a, a lot. And uh, I have some things that I've worked out that, you know, are Elvin-ish. And I think they get you into that space. Yeah. But he sounds like two drummers to me. And I once asked his brother, uh, his older brother, Hank, who piano player, Hank Jones, who... Uh, was well known in his own right. I saw him at a concert or at a club one night, and I said, "What is it with your brother Alvin?" I said, "You know, I try to figure out some of the things he's playing, and I, it, it sounds like two people sometimes." Mm-hmm. He says, "Well, a lot of people don't know this. I don't know. Maybe he was putting me on, but he said a lot of people don't know this. But Alvin had a twin when he died. <laughs> the twin died when Alvin was born. There was wow. a twin. Oh man." And he says, don't ask me about it, but our brother Thad has a theory about your question. And that, and he left me with that. So Man. I went, oh, Elvin <laughs> and his twin are playing at the same time. That's I don't know. crazy. And that's it. That was, yeah, that was crazy because sometimes it's, sometimes he sounds like two people at once. That's so, um, that's just like, it makes you just think so hard i mean yeah that's so sad that that happened obviously that to his twin but man i'm sure he he internalized that and for me when you hear a drummer you just sort of like let it like it it sort of subliminally you start to be like oh that's cool and then later on you're like it just comes out at these little these little moments where you're like oh that kind of sounded like uh <laughs> i hope that sounded like something that like you know louis belson did or, or you know something like that but um, oh and yeah another friend of mine and a wonderful drummer louis belson for sure yeah um i want to mention uh, a studio drummer that uh i s- saw play with steely dan on youtube ricky lawson ricky lawson i gotta check him out ricky lawson is playing with steely dan and that groove he plays is so badass and you know how do you analyze that i don't know it just feels so good you know and uh and he's a deep cat he must have played a lot of spiritual stuff maybe worked on polyrhythms i don't know but maybe worked gospel or but the groove the way he plays but he's also reading some very very difficult parts and he's playing them without losing any of the groove and any of the flavor of what he's doing to make this band sound so, you know, sure. down home and yeah, and and, and danceable, if, if, if for lack of a better word. Yeah, and he's playing in the. I'm, I just googled him. He's playing Remo drums, which is sort of like Louis played those. Louis Belson played those for a while. Um, which that's we talked about those drums in the the Remo episode on the show, but um. Just cool to see another guy playing that uh, that kind of short lived line of of drums. Yeah, by Remo. off off brand. Yeah, yeah. I pl- I played those for a little while. They're good drums. They yeah, are, they are good. Louis Louis owned part of the company though. So. Oh, that's yeah. Well, and I remember um, when I talked to um, Herbie from from Remo, he was just telling me that like he was like the main point of those drums was to sell pre tuned heads. Like they were like the heads were pre-tuned and it was like a whole new technology and the drums were kind of secondary, which I wasn't sure if that, I was like, well, the, I don't think these huge drummers would be playing them. I mean, obviously he's the expert cause he works for Remo, but, um, uh, I don't know the, not the drums I played anyway. They, they weren't, they, they that's were, what they I, were regular drums that that's tuned, what I figured tuned the heads, but, yeah. uh, but they but, sounded really good. I have to say they were, they were quite, Quite good drums, but they sure. they never took off because the, the shells were, uh, I think, uh, a, a little bit different enough that uh, drummers didn't quite get it, you know. Yeah, so, sure. But, now, uh, are you a um, are you a collector of like vintage drums? Are you like a you know vintage drum guy, or no. are you no? Yeah, no. I have a couple vintage drums uh, in, in my studio, and uh, yeah, I just don't have time to. I appreciate that, and I love looking looking at them. When and the guys who do it are are so uh, knowledgeable about it, and uh, but uh, they're 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 great to look at, and uh, I, I love them when I see them. But uh, yeah, I don't have much room to put any vintage stuff around in my studio anyway. So <laughs> sure, yeah, that makes sense. Now, um, I think now is a good time to tell people the classic where they can find you what you're up to obviously it's covid but maybe you know in the future and um 
if people can take lessons with you online, how they go about doing that. Sure. Well, uh, I give Skype lessons and uh, I have about uh, 20 students I'm teaching on Skype. And um, I'm at uh, www.petermagadini.com. And uh, I can be reached uh, through my website. Um, I want to give a shout out to Brett Bellis, one of my students. And I think Brett uh, mentioned uh, my name to you at some point. So. Thank you so much for doing that. I always try and do it and sometimes try and give the shout out. So thank you to Brett again. Um, And people who listen to the show know that, I mean, it's kind of cool that like most of the episodes now, for the most part, have turned into ones that people have recommended, which um, makes my life easier. I just need to find the right people, which for you, when he recommends talk to Pete Magadini, it was easy to find Pete Magadini. But uh, (laughs) some of them are like pretty out there and I have to find an expert. But um, yeah. Big thank you to Brett. That's that's very cool. He recommended you. And I, lo- I love that you're so eclectic with your show and uh, you have so many different facets going at the same time. Uh, it's uh, That's really terrific. Uh, I thank can you. see why Brett likes it so much. He said, Pete, you got to check this out, man. I've been listening to all these podcasts. They're, <laughs> they're really happening. So Oh, that's awesome. I, I appreciate that a lot. That And I've tried to keep it eclectic. And I, I added it up. Uh, so this... Probably when this comes out, it'll be like episode 82 or three or something. And if you, I mean, if you do the math, they're each about an hour. So you can listen for, if you listen straight, you have a couple days, like three or four days of straight drum history. Yeah, I can see it. I don't recommend doing that, but, um, (laughs) but yeah, no, that's, that's great. So, um, so petermagadini.com, correct? Yeah. Okay. www.petermagadini.com. Okay, Peter and then M A G A D I N I dot yeah. com. People can find you there. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Well, Pete, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here. And I'm going to link in the show notes to where, obviously, your website, but um, I'll put a specific link for that, uh, the Polyrhythm book, um, because I think a lot of people will like that. And a lot of listeners, which I love, actually buy the books that we talk about. Um, which is really cool. Well, I should mention my uh, my my drum set book because that's a really important book. That's what I teach more than anything. Sure. It's called Learn to Play the Drum Set All in One. Used to be two books. They combined it into one. It just was re- re-released uh, about three years ago, and it's published by Hal Leonard, and uh, it's uh, 75 pages, and it takes you from the beginning if you're just starting out with drums, uh, and it gets you playing right away. And uh, then it gets into the more uh, complex stuff and the linear drumming, which we didn't talk about much, but it's important. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's another book, the two polyrhythm books, and then learn to play the drum set all in one. Um, a lot of teachers use that book, uh, and uh, and a lot of students have, have gone through it with me and, and maybe some other teachers, but it's kind of proven itself, and it's, it's hung in there, so... Uh, yeah. If you're if you're interested in in anything that I do and some of the concepts that I have, my all my things aren't about polyrhythms. That's a small part of it. So sure, of course, yeah. You're not just the polyrhythm guy. You're yeah. You're, you're multifaceted. Trying not to uh, <laughs> <laughs> trying to escape the being just that. So. I know, but hey, that's it's good to have something that people know you for. But um, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, Pete, thank you for coming on the show. And uh, I look forward to hopefully catching a clinic of yours or seeing you live when um, we get through all of the 2020 uh, craziness. Yeah, actually, I did a clinic here in Chicago a couple of years ago. It's called the Chicago Polyrhythm Clinic. It's up on YouTube. Cool. Uh, you might you might want to check that out. Absolutely. Cool. I'll, I'll link to that as well. Awesome. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.